just one more night. I'm so tired of walking all alone. Oh Lord, help me smile. I know the smile, just one more smile. I don't think I. Can make it on my own. I never thought I need a house before. I thought that I could get by. Father, we do thank you for this minister's conference. We know that you have called us for a purpose, and we're here this weekend or this week so that you can remind us again the things some of us might be forgetting, and so that you'll challenge us again so we can do the work the way it ought to be done. Father, we're asking that all through this period, you'll bless us mightily in Jesus' name. Amen. We're asking that your word will enrich our lives. And we're asking, O oh Lord, that in such a mighty, tangible way, that your word will speak to our hearts and we'll be able to go back with zeal, with power, with vision, so that the work will be done in a very great way. Lord, we're praying that the work you've committed into our hands will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. That all hindrances within us and around us will be taken out of the way and will give you the chance to work in our lives. Amen. Father, we are praying that as you speak to us through the different speakers that we'll use this week, we'll not reject your word. Amen. We'll take in everything that you have to say unto us. Amen. Use everyone that will minister in this place for the edification of the ministers of the gospel. Amen. And use us after we've gone back for the expansion of your kingdom. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In a beginning message like this, we like to point the direction in which we'll be going. We also need to show why we're here and what we believe that we'll be receiving from the Lord. Today I want to talk to you on the secrets of a successful ministry. The secrets of a successful ministry. Those of us who are here this week, we obviously are involved in the work of the Lord. And some of us already have been experiencing some success in the work of the ministry. Others might have got some disappointments. And some of us might be asking the question, why? Some of us might be confused. Some of us might be experiencing some things in our lives and ministries that we might feel the answer is to pack up and to stop the ministry completely. But as we look at this message, Secrets of a Successful Ministry, I'm believing that if we open our ears and open our hearts, we may discover the reasons why we have the problems we're having. Something you'll find out in this conference is that the people that will be speaking to you 
we will be interested in telling you the truth. Sometimes we'll be telling you the truth in such a natural, normal, naked way that sometimes it may look shocking that you have not heard people minister like that before. Or we might be able to apply some maturity and tell you the truth. But let's understand that sometimes truth burns like fire. And sometimes truth can be very, very inconvenient. But it has always been my own belief that if I go to a conference where people are serious with the Lord, if I listen to any message from anyone, I like them to tell me the truth. I do not like to travel a long distance, attend a conference, and all that the speakers will do is just to make us laugh, entertain us, and gloss over our problems, and never mention why we're having the problems we're having. Uh, if I were a participant and not a speaker, I'll be asking the Lord to tell me all the truth I need to know about myself, about him, about the ministry, and about the word of God. And by the grace of God, we'll endeavor to tell you all that we know. We'll not just be talking about methods. There are church growth conferences that you attend, and all they say is, what do you do? How do you make the church to grow? What are the techniques? What are the methods? But I'm of the conviction that a person that doesn't have an acceptable life in the sight of God, whatever method he uses, God will not bless the work. God blesses the people that will be totally sold out to him, that will say, Lord, whatever it takes, whatever you demand of me, I want to do it. I believe that such people will have ministries that are blessed wonderfully of the Lord. And as we talk about the secrets of a successful ministry, I want to emphasize that before we can even talk about a ministry at all, you must be a member of the church. And you'll be surprised that there are many people that just feel that the first thing in their lives is that they are called to be ministers. But before you are ministers of the church, you must be a member of the church. I do not mean of a denomination. I'm sorry to tell you, there are many people that are members of the visible church. They are not members of the invisible church. There are people that are known on denominational records and church records, on registers of a particular church, visible church, but there's no record about them in heaven. They have a name that they live, but they are dead dead in sins and trespasses. And Jesus did say before he left that on the last day, many will say unto me, have we not prophesied in your name? We have preached. We even did it in your name. And we did many wonderful works. Then he said, I will say unto them, I never knew you. I suppose somebody that will have prophesied in Jesus' name, done many wonderful works in Jesus' name, and would have wrought many signs, wonders, and miracles, He'll be known in the visible church. But then Jesus said, I will say unto them, I never knew you. That should terrify anybody. And that should make you to find out whether you are a member of the church to start with before you become a minister in the church. So I talk on the conversion to the Savior's side. In Exodus chapter 32, Exodus chapter 32, I'm reading from verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. I believe that you know this story, that the children of Israel had gone away from the Lord. They had reared up, raised up, an idol to worship. In the midst of that idol worship, Moses came unto them. He was so sad. The commandment that was given to him from the Lord, he broke everything, just smashed them to pieces. Because it's no use giving the tables of stone to the people that have turned their backs on the Lord. But here they were, that they still needed to serve the Lord. They needed ministers, Levites, people that will do the work. And so he first of all called them to the Savior's side, to the Lord's side. And he said, who is on the Lord's side? Today we call that making an altar call. 
And I tell you, if you have never responded to the altar call to come to the Savior's side, you cannot respond to the ministry call. You, you first of all have to come to the altar. Lord, I know myself to be a sinner before I can become a preacher. I know myself to have gone astray before I can seek the lost. I know myself to have gone away from the Lord before I can gather into the kingdom. I know myself to have sinned because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God before I can tell sinners come to the sight of the Lord. And so Moses gave the altar call and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. As Bible students and Bible preachers, you know that those were the people that God used eventually. So then, we need to respond to the call to the Savior's side. I've met with those who are called ministers of the gospel who have never been born again. And to be born again is something totally strange to them. Just this year, I have counseled and I've spoken to ministers, preachers of the word of God in different churches and denominations that to be born again was something totally strange to them. And we need to face the real issue that if we have not been born again, we are not yet in the kingdom. How do I get water out of a dry well? How do I get rain out of a cloudless sky? How do I get grace out of a graceless heart? How can a preacher who has not known the Lord bring other people to know the Lord? Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, ye must be born again. That's why we have to start. And if we have not been born again, there is nothing shameful about it. It's just that somebody might not have told us. Somebody might not have called us to the Savior's side. So before we can talk about ministering and preaching and serving in the church, we must know whether we are on the Lord's side or not. In Mark chapter 1, reading from verse 15, and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now as they walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. He was calling them to minister. He was calling them to preach. He was calling them to the work of apostleship. But then he first of all said, Repent ye and believe the gospel. So then, before we can be fishers of men, before the Lord can bless our ministry, and before we can have success in the work that we believe the Lord has committed into our hands, we must have repented. To repent means to turn away from sin. Not what we used to do. Like when uh, I was very, very young, I went to church all right. I read the Bible all right. I sang all right. But then, there was something very common then. Every Sunday, the preachers told us to pray, Lord, we're sorry. We have done what we shouldn't have done. We have not done what we should have done. And I don't know how many years I said that. I never repented. I made confessions without turning away from my sins. I repeated what they told us to repeat, forgive us this day our sin. But then, I wasn't ready to give up those sins. That's no repentance. You won't take anybody serious. If the person came to you last week, I'm sorry I offended you. What I shouldn't have done against you, I did. What I should have done, I didn't do. You say, well, that's all right. I'm ready to forgive. He came back the following morning and said, good morning. I just came to tell you I've offended you. What I shouldn't have done, I've done. What I have done, I shouldn't have done. Well, change now. Then the third day he came to you again and said, and you are now guessing what it's likely to say. Well, I'm sorry about this. What I shouldn't have done, I have done. You say, get out of my sight. Do you know that's what God is saying to many people that are praying? He says, get out of my sight. You don't mean to follow the Lord. You are not serious about what you are saying. 
If you know you have not done what you should have done, and you have been doing what you shouldn't have been doing, repent of it. Repent ye and believe the gospel. What's the gospel? That God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You might be angry if I told you the truth, but the truth is this. Water will not cleanse away anybody's sin. White garment will never cleanse away anybody's sin. And nothing that we do on our own, nothing that we sacrifice on our own can take away sin. We sing it, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in you. And we say, could my tears forever flow, my zeal no respite no, all this for sin cannot atone, thou and thou alone must save. What can wash away my sin? What's the answer? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But the same people that sing that will have confidence in a white garment. Will have confidence in so-called holy water. And there is no water that is holy. Just ordinary water. And the water cannot take away your sin. Nothing will take away the, uh, the sin of anyone except the blood of Jesus. But God will not forgive until I repent. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And then he saw those people, fishermen, and he said, follow me. What do you follow him to? You don't follow him to a dancing hall. You know, I'm surprised and shocked. When I see some people, they say, you know, I'm following the Lord. They go to the theater every night. And I say, no, you are not following the Lord. Because you never follow the Lord to a theater. You never follow the Lord to a dancing hall. You never follow the Lord to a drinking place, a drinking party. If we are born again, our lives are totally different. And we might as well tell the truth. There is nobody that is in a secret cult that is born again. If a person is still walking along with principalities and powers, if a person is still going along with juju, with magic, with all these charms, and he says, you know, I'm following the Lord, we say that's a lie. If somebody is following the Lord, there will be a change of life. And I've found people that they've never turned away from their sins. They've never turned away from their evils. And they say, praise the Lord, I'm a minister. You are not even a member of the church yet. A member of the church of the firstborn. A member of the church of the living God. Because it says, repent ye and believe the gospel. Follow me, then I make you fishers of men. And an example of somebody that followed the Lord like that, that repented at a change of life. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who enabled me, that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, but then immediately Paul the Apostle said that, that he has put me into the ministry. He said, who was before a blasphemer? Now, the English language there, who was before, means I'm no more a blasphemer. I've repented. I've changed. You find a minister that will curse, use abusive language, and blaspheme? That's not a member of the church. Has not even started following the Lord yet. I was before a drunkard. If I'm still a drunkard, no repentance. I was before a terrible man, a violent man. If I am still a terrible, violent man, I've not repented. But I was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy. By grace I was saved. Not our own works. It is the gift of God. And he said, because I did it. Notice that he was talking in past tense. Not that I am doing it now. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I'm a minister of the gospel. I am still smoking now. I'm still drinking now. I'm still fighting now. I'm still doing evil now. I did it in the past. I don't do that anymore. We, we used to sing that the things I used to do, I do them no more. 
The places I used to go, I go there no more. The things I used to say, I say them no more. Something happened, a change came upon me when, since I became born again. And that's what the Bible teaches. That if we know the Lord, the things we did before, we're no more doing. In verse 14, the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And so then Paul the Apostle had this, that before he came into the service, he first of all came to the Savior. I read a passage in Jeremiah, and I felt how true today. In Jeremiah chapter 2, and verse 8, the priests said not, where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also have transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal, and walked after things that do not profit. So it's not a new problem. The problem had been with the people of God for a long, long time. That at the time of Jeremiah, God had a controversy with the people of Israel and with the shepherds of Israel. And he said, the people that handle the law, they do not know me. I've never known them as mine. They have never called upon me. I have never known them. And yet, they handle the law. And I want to say, the Holy Ghost has a monopoly on Bible interpretation. That means I can never understand the Bible without the Holy Ghost. Do you believe that? Yes. If a man has not known the Lord, he does not have the Holy Ghost. We can go to seminary. We can read all our catechism. We can read all the things we want to read about religion. Without the Holy Ghost, you'll never understand the Bible. The Holy Ghost is the author of the Bible. Because it says all scripture is given by inspiration. And it is good, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And if a man has not known the Lord, Jesus is not living on the inside. The Holy Ghost is not living on the inside. The power of God is not there. How does he understand the Bible? And it's the terrible thing when God himself said, the people that handle the law, they do not know me. Then he said, the pastors have transgressed against me. I would dare say that God doesn't overlook sin in anybody. Pastor, member of a church, anybody. God takes his word of holiness seriously. Now I'm not ashamed to say that I believe in holiness. I preach holiness. And I believe that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. No, it's not popular today. I've traveled to many places. I've been invited to many places to come and preach. And the moment you begin to say, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord, they drag their feet on the ground. They show you they don't appreciate that. They want you to talk about the methods and the techniques and the strategies, how to do this, how to do this. We can do nothing if our lives are not pure. We can make noise. We can use radio. We can use television. We can use newspaper, we can use tracks, we can gather people together. It's not hard to gather people together. Footballers gather people together. Athletes gather people together. If we're gathering them to the kingdom of God, there must be holiness as a foundational experience. If it is not there, the Lord is not going to waste his time, waste his resources on people that do not take him seriously. And so God himself complained, and he had a controversy. He said, the people that handle the law, they do not know me. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When we come into Christ, old things will pass away. And the New Testament says all things are become new. You know, I'm afraid of preachers that change or modify the word of God. Because the Bible says that if you add to the word of God, God shall add unto that man all these plagues that are written in the book. 
If you take away from the word of God, God shall take away that name, the name of that person from the book of life. When it says, old things are passed away, I believe old things are passed away. And all things have become new and there is a change. And thank God there are people that are accepting the word of God and the change is coming upon them in a supernatural way. And if you will accept the word of God and you will say, yes, I give my life to serve the Lord and if I'm ignorant of something, I want to be told. I want to know about it. And within this week, I didn't come to play. I didn't come to be entertained. Within this week, whatever God is revealing to me to be wrong, I want to take everything out of the way. And I'm assuring you, if you'll take every stumbling block, every hindrance, every sin, every backsliding out of the way, you'll be surprised what God will do with you. We've read about people like D.L. Moody. We've read about people like Spurgeon. We've read about people like Finney. People that shook their generation for the Lord. Why can't God do it today? I believe he can do it. Yes. But you know, many of us, we just practice gimmicks, just methods. Thinking that God can be used and God can be brought on the stage. And if I can maneuver God very well, then God can work some miracles and I can fill my church. Why am I interested in filling my church with people that I won't find in the kingdom of God when I get there? Why do I want to waste my time, waste my life, waste all my labor? Why don't we go back to what we were doing before and continue to work in a secular employment so that at least you live a normal Christian life? When you get to heaven, you know you are not going to be judged as a minister. You are going to be judged as a member because I believe the judgment of ministers will be more serious than the judgment of members. You see, where does the Bible say that? The Bible says to whom much is given, much will be required. And if the judgment is going to be more serious on the ministers, more than on the members, then let's judge ourselves now. Let's find out if all things have passed away, if all things have become new. If they are not new, let's start all over again and say, Lord, everything must become new. And I'm believing that this week, if we will be sincere with the Lord, things that have been old, everything ought to become new. We have to go back to our stations, to our churches, to our ministries. New people, changed people. Now, after the call or after the conversion to the Savior's side, we have call into the service. We count one before we count two. We come to the Savior before we get into the service. We know the Lord of the work before we become involved in the work of the Lord. Amos chapter 7 and I'm reading there from verse 10 then Amaziah the priest of Bethel said to Jeroboam king of Israel saying Amos has compiled against thee in the midst of the house of Israel the land is not able to bear all his words have you ever found people complaining about preachers of the word of God, it was like that in Bible days. Amaziah the priest complained and he said, the message of Amos, this is too bad, this is too strict, this is too deep for us. The land is not able to bear messages like that. That's what some counselors have told me many years ago. When we were just 3,000 in deeper life in Lagos, and they knew that we were preaching holiness. Oh, they said, those people will scatter. If you keep on teaching them holiness, you keep on teaching that you should live right, you keep on telling them that in their places of work, they will not uh, cheat, they will not give bribes, they will not do all those things. One, they will become poor. Not only that they will become poor, when they get married and they are not able to feed their children, many of them will run away from the church. Well, I felt I'm not looking for numbers. You know, it surprises me sometimes. What you are not looking for is what God gives you. If you just say, Lord, I want to serve you. Now there are 3,000. If they become 1,000, I'm still going to serve you. If they even slash down to 500, I'm going to serve you. So I preached holiness more than before. I wanted to test the word of the Lord. 
Is it error that will prosper the work of God or truth that will prosper the work of God? I wanted to test it. So I read the Bible. I searched in the Bible. I preached it as hard as I could. I was surprised within one year of preaching so seriously like that, we added 1,000 to the membership of the church. Some people said it's because they are not having Sunday worship. If you are having Sunday worship and you preach like that, you won't get offering. If you preach like that, you won't get the people. The people will scatter. They will go away. They will go to where the things are easy. So the Lord led us. We started Sunday worship. And we didn't change the doctrine. We still kept on teaching them on holiness, on the truth of the word of God, on being honest and doing what you ought to do everywhere that you are. And we're surprised that within a few years, before we were just about 5,000, in uh, about two years we became 10,000. So some other people uh, said, well, maybe it's because you're still young. And you'll discover that if you look at all, when you are preaching like that, true you can get to 5,000, 6,000, 8,000, 10,000, but if you find out those people, you'll have only motorcycles in that place. You won't have car owners. You won't have educated people that will come into, they are always giving us all these excuses why we need to preach a little bit of error and not keep strict with the word of God. So we kept on. To cut a long story short, now, even though we are preaching holiness, we have problem with car park. The cars are too many. Now we even have to be telling the people, why not get on the bus sometimes and see what it looks like, rather than bringing your car. There's nowhere to park the car. And if you have opportunity of coming to the church, during this time, in fact, I've scheduled it in such a way that on Sunday, you'll be attending the last service. I did it deliberately. Because, you see, people will feel that when you come to the morning service, yes, we understand why there are many. Because that's morning service. When you attend our last service, if you are not careful, there will be nowhere to sit in the last service. And we still keep on teaching them the word of God. And if you listen to the cassettes of the messages we're giving them, I think we're even more serious now than we were many years ago on the teaching of the word of God and the work of God is going on. I throw the challenge to you. Test God. See what you can do. Be faithful to God. See what you can do. Stand on the word of God and see what you can do. And just stick to that word, whatever the people are doing, whatever other people are preaching, stay with the word of God and see what progress and success we would have. Let's look at verse 12. Also, Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou fear, go, flee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. But prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. It says, it is the king's chapel, that's where you cannot tell the whole truth. And I'm sorry that is still true today. There are some cathedrals, you cannot tell the whole truth. If you talk about people belonging to secret society, that's the last time you are going to preach there. It's a chapel. You talk about polygamy, that's the last time you are going to preach in that place. That's the king's chapel. That's where the dignitaries go. And that's where they worship. And you don't preach to all those people about the authority and the truth of the word of God. If they won't allow us to preach, then leave that place. Go where you can preach the truth. Go where people are interested in getting into the kingdom of God. Where people will know that it's only the way of the Lord that will get us saved. We cannot carve out a new way, a new religious way. The Bible is a complete revelation. And if we do not follow this revelation, then we are lost. There's no hope. And so they said, do not prophesy. Do not speak all this in the king's chapel. In verse 14, then answered Amos and said unto Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was an earth man and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. Amos said, listen, it's not my fault. I didn't want to preach. And I can say the same thing as Amos said. Sometimes some people say there's a deeper life and then sometimes they mention my name, but Maybe they don't understand. 
I wasn't a preacher. I was just a lecturer. I wasn't thinking I wanted to preach. I was, I was uh, taught and schooled and trained under an atheist. And we learned about atheism. We learned there was no God. There was no miracle. There was no prayer. There was no power. There was no Christ. There was no religion. The Bible was just writing of the Jews. That's what we learned. And we learned about all the atheists of the past generations. And I follow the principle so much that he even loved me to the point he sent me to university. And the Mayflower School paid all my school fees, gave me all the pocket money I need. And I came back there still teaching. I, I love that school. But God called me. It's not my fault. And all the things that they taught us before, I began to see they are not true. That there is God. And I, I didn't know about knowing God. I wasn't planning I would serve God. I wasn't running after God saying, Lord, I want this, I want this, I want that. I was getting in all these principles and atheistic ideologies. But then God spoke his word to my heart and said, give me your heart. And it was real that I stand at the door and knock. I couldn't see him, but I was hearing the knock. It was deep. I could sense it. And then the altar call was made. I went forward. I prayed. Joy filled my heart. The things I did before, I couldn't do them anymore. All the time we were being taught on atheism. I was stealing library book from the school. When I got converted, I went to Tashola and I said, I've been stealing all the library books. I made all the confessions. And he looked at me and said, you have always been one of my good boys. I said, yes, but good boy did not really make it. I was still stealing and doing things that were wrong. He saw that a change came over my life. All my other friends at school, they said it will soon be over. They gave me two weeks that all those things will be over. More, almost 25 years have come and gone. It's not over yet. And I still love the Lord. And when I went to the university, what was I doing? I was studying my mathematics day and night, day and night, till 2 a.m. in the night, 3 a.m. in the night. I wasn't thinking I would be a pastor, I would be a minister. I was just burning the candle at both hands. When I came out, I came out with first class. Immediately, they gave me scholarship to go for PhD. And that was my life. But I was feeling that God wanted me to preach. And if you ask people that knew me before, in about eight years of Christianity, in the church I was going, I never stood up, after I became born again, I never stood up to give a one-minute testimony. I was so, so shy. I couldn't talk to people. I couldn't even witness to people. So it's not something that I wanted to do. Eventually, God gave me books of John Wesley, books of Charles Finney. I started reading. When I was reading those books on holiness, I wasn't marking them saying, I will preach this, I will preach this, I will read it, I will go on my knees and I will say, God, just make me holy, take me to heaven. Just holy, take me to heaven. And then when I came to Lagos University, one day, I just felt that God wanted me to come to Lagos. So I went to the office of the provost. When I got to his office, I said, I'm kind of feeling that I should come and lecture here. I was a student, and I went to tell the provost, I'm kind of feeling that I should come and lecture here. They looked at my certificate. He said, come in without interview. That's how I became a lecturer there. So they said, but you must do research. I said, it's all right. Then the Bible study started of deeper life. As the Bible study started, I didn't have time for research anymore. I just became buried in Bible and preaching and going for retreats and going for this and going for that. So university called me and said, be careful. Because if you do not do the research, then we'll have to fire you. That means you'll have to go. So I said, um, can you give me just uh, three months? Now it will normally take me about uh, one year or more. That work I wanted to do. So they said, they'll give me three months. And I went away to Alexandria. Within three weeks, I'd finished what I wanted to do. And I came back and I showed them the paper. It's not that I can't do it. You know, this is the paper. They looked at it. It was, they've never seen anything like that before. And yet God called me after the whole research and the big salary and everything and said, abandon it, do my work. So it's not all that I do. It's not because I want to do this. I want to be a pastor. I want to raise a large church. I never knew that a church can be large. This is the Lord's doing. 
And he has sent me to tell other people that what he did with me, he can do with other people. But the way he did it with me is that he made me to love him, to desire him above any other thing on the face of the earth, and to preach his word without fear, without favor. Now you know it is not common on the first message like this in conferences where you bring many, many pastors together and tell them that holy water cannot save. We like the people to be happy. I like you to be happy, but I don't like the deceiver to be happy. It's good to be happy in righteousness. It's good to be happy when we are following the ways of the Lord. The apostles in the Bible, in the New Testament, they didn't make sinners happy. They made sinners uncomfortable. They didn't make backsliders happy. They made backsliders uncomfortable. And if I'm doing something wrong, I'd like somebody to come to me and make me uncomfortable. It's good to be uncomfortable now so I can be comfortable in heaven. It's good to be unhappy now so that I can be eternally happy when I get to heaven. And so, first, the conversion to the Savior's side. Number two, the call to service. And so Amos said, it's not my fault. I didn't just jump into the thing. God himself called me. And in Acts of the Apostles chapter 26, Acts chapter 26, verse 19, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. He said, I felt the call. I knew the call. How did he know the call? Well, the way it happened with me is that as I continued lecturing, a burden, serious, great burden came upon me. When I saw people, I saw they were dying in sin. And I wanted to do something so that they will be saved. At other times, I had real passion for souls. My food lost the taste. All I wanted was that, Lord, how can I be used of you? So that I can tell people of the Savior. When I saw people that were not born again, in my heart, in my mind, I'd be eager, Lord, if I can have an opportunity of telling them how to be born again. Eventually, I became so dissatisfied with everything else. Everything else. The money, the prestige, the position at the university, the certificate I had, and all the things that the people were saying about me as a lecturer. Because uh, as a lecturer, I was still talking to a medical doctor um, about two weeks ago. And he said when he was at Lewis, and he mixed with other students from Unilag, they used to say that if that man taught you anything and you didn't uh, understand, nobody else can teach you anymore. But I became dissatisfied with all that. And do you know that, I think 1982, I sent out a letter of resignation. I said, I'm going. The university got the letter. They tore it to pieces and they said, we know you are preaching. You want to preach, keep on preaching, but we can't lose you at the university. That you must remain. So I said, Lord, what will I do? So I kept on. Eventually, the burden became unbearable. The dissatisfaction. If I went to the lectures, I knew all the things. I could teach them for hours without my notes because, you know, it was in the brain. But then, even teaching all those things, when I finish, I'll be saying, is this how I'm going to spend the rest of my life? Just teaching people mathematics, how they would build bridges and do this, applied math and all that. Is this the rest of my life? It was so much upon me that I tendered another letter again. And I went to beg the head of department. I said, look, I'm writing another letter to resign this time. Please, when it comes, help me out. I'm miserable. Let them pass. Let them release me. He said, Mr. Kumoyi, I know what you mean. We'll release you this time. That's how they released me. But I was with that head of uh, department yesterday because he's uh, supposed to travel out. He's now a member of our church. <laughs> and um, I want to tell you that my psychology lecturer is the, is the number one psychologist in the whole of uh, Nigeria among university lecturers. He's now a member of my church too. <laughs> and um, the, the people that were, you know, really up on the line when I was lecturing, many of them, I was counseling one, one of them just last week. He's now a member of the church from the University of Lagos. You know, they are just coming. They are just coming. The Lord is reaching out to their hearts. 
you know, I believe that if you will totally surrender your life to the Lord, you'll be surprised what the Lord will do. My own head of department, when I was lecturing under him, he will make fun. He will say, no, there's nothing to all that. Whenever we talk to him, he will say, well, Mr. Kumui, I know all that, but I don't, I don't want anything to do with all that. But thank God now, he comes for counseling. He asks questions, what should I do here? What should I do here? What should I do there? And think of a person like that, who could have been my head of department, making restitution. Calling somebody, well, I thought you were my enemy before, but now I am born again. You are not my enemy anymore. The grace of God. The goodness of God. Just last week, I was talking to an ambassador. He had, he had gone away on ambassadorial service uh, from the university. Now he's uh, come back, he's served his term, he's back at the university again now. And I was talking to him last week. And he was saying that he's never got any peace like this before. Now that he's born again, the peace of God just overflowing like a river. You know, when you hear testimonies like that, you say, Lord, let me do more of this. And I believe that as we sincerely give ourselves to the Lord, and we say, Lord, whatever you need to knock out of my life, whatever you need to chisel away from my life, I am responding to the call to service. And I will not be disobedient to the heavenly vision. And I saw that when I stepped into the ministry, the joy in service. You know, you preach just one message, and the joy that you receive is more than when you are working at uh, p &T. More than when you are working at Port Authority. More than when you are working at uh, the civil service. They gave you money when you were working over there. And now you preach and there is no money. You are like a king. You sleep at night. You know that you are in the calling that God has called you to in life. That's real life. The people out there are miserable. But the people in the kingdom of God who are following after the Lord, they are the people that have the real joy. But before I close, I must tell you that if we're really going to do this work for the Lord, we have some qualifications to fulfill. Nowadays, there are many people that say that they feel the call to the service, but they do not know that there are qualifications for them to fulfill before they come into the service. In Acts chapter 6, Reading from verse 2. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason, not reasonable, that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. We need to check up our sincerity and our honesty. We all know the conditions of the country, the austerity, the poverty, and everything you can think about. But when a minister leaves the preaching of the gospel, and it's like a businessman with members of the church, carrying on business. And the business is diverting his attention. And all his days and nights, all he's thinking about is, I will buy that and sell that, do this and do that. We need to check up again if that is the will of the Lord. Or if it is, we do not have faith in God. We think that we have to do all that to make ends meet because the Lord who has called us cannot really fulfill the demands of our lives. This apostle said, it is not reasonable that we leave the word of God <coughs> and serve tables. Wherefore, look out men among you of honest report. These were just deacons in the church, and the deacons in the church were to be of honest report. I believe then that a higher standard is required from those who are real preachers of the word of God. And let's check it out. If we are owing amounts of money to members of the church, how can we preach the truth? Every time you have a need, you go to that member of the church, can you lend me 200 naira there? Can you lend me 300 naira there? I dare tell you, if that man commits adultery, you cannot open your mouth. 
because you are his debtor, you are not his pastor. You are the pastor to the other people, but you are the debtor to that man. We are not of honest report. If the ladies that are coming to the church, we say that we are helping them, we are counseling them, and then they are cooking for you, and while they are cooking for you, your wife is not around, and you are handle them, and you commit immorality with them. If you don't really commit the remorse to them, you are offending them. And these ladies know that, well, a pastor is like any other human being. Has no control, no power over his body. Ah, we are honest report. When those ladies, when they do anything wrong, we cannot challenge them. Because if we challenge them, ah, they will say, Pastor, nobody is perfect. Even Pastor himself, we all know the story. So, Pastor, don't, if you say too much about me over the pulpit, your secrets are in my hand. You keep quiet. Say, well, well, if God should mark iniquity, you will stand. So, everything will die down. Then you'll be a slave of that girl. If that girl will say, ah, Pastor, if you talk like that and you deal with me like that, I will tell your wife what has been going on between us. It's, ah, uh, 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 keep quiet. Don't let us make trouble. I know your weaknesses, but I will overlook everything. We overlook what we should discipline because we are not living right. And those ladies in the church and those people we are borrowing money from, they silence us. We cannot preach the Bible. But I would rather come to shame temporarily. I would rather have that girl say what you want to go and say. Let me totally repent. And let me be free once and for all. Rather than we're in bondage to that lady, we're in bondage to the people we have borrowed money from. It's better to die of hunger than to be borrowing money from members of the church and then I cannot preach the truth anymore. Or we say, the church building needs a large amount of money. We need to build it. Well, I'm not going to take the money from a smuggler, from a robber, from a person that is not living right, so that I cannot correct the person, I cannot teach the person anymore. You see, many of us pastors, many things have gone wrong. And we have to be sincere. We have to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to start all over again. I know I am called. I know I have a ministry. If what is destroying my ministry is this little thing here, little thing there, little thing there, Lord, I'm bringing everything to the altar. I'm going to settle everything. If I need to repent all over again, need conversion all over again, need cleansing all over again, need a overhauling, a total change all over again, Lord, I'm ready, here am I. And I believe that if you will do that with the Lord, you'll be surprised what he can make of you. Let me remind you, maybe you know this, but I'll tell you, I've never gone to any seminary. I've never gone to any Bible college. I've never taken, I don't have any certificate, I don't have any diploma on theology. I do not have anything except the Bible and a sincere heart. And I love God. If God tells me I'm wrong on one issue today, I'll cry like a baby. If God tells me that I should tell the church that something is wrong, I'll go to the church and say, God told me to tell you this, that I've been wrong on this side. That's why God is blessing the world. I don't want my heart to be hard like that of Saul. Saul did something wrong. And Samuel came to him and challenged him and said, You have not obeyed the Lord. He said, Well, I've obeyed the Lord. It's the people that got all the sheep. Then he said, Because of that, you've lost the ministry. But look at David on the other hand. David did something more terrible than Saul. He committed adultery. Nathan came to him and Nathan gave him a parable. And David, like a king, judged, said, Who did that? That person should be punished. And Nathan said, Thou art the man. David didn't say, Okay, hold it, shut up, I am king. He said, Nathan, you know what? I'm a big sinner. And how many people are like that today? That's why God used that man to write so many psalms. That's why God used that man to win so many battles. That's why God used that man so that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will come through him. That's why he said, I've given an everlasting covenant unto David. Not because he never did anything wrong, but because when it was pointed out to him, he said, yes, I'm sorry, I've done wrong. 
And if I am like that, then God will have favor on me. If you are like that, God will have favor on you. The secret of a successful ministry is not certificate. There are many certificates that are just hanging there. God is not going to use certificates, seminary knowledge, a soft heart, an open Bible, sincerity, repentance, saying, God, I have missed it, I'm coming back. And if you are like that tonight, if Jesus tarries, many years after this time, you will look back to this day and you will say, that's the place I got the secret of a successful ministry. I don't believe that God is a respecter of persons. I don't believe that anybody is so special in the hand of God. What he's doing with me, he can do with you. What he's doing with other people, he can do with everybody. But God leads us to go before him and say, Lord, I missed it in that point. 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 I told you all this tonight because God told me to tell you. If I wanted to be popular with you, I won't tell you this. The way I've told you these things, I'm not looking for popularity or entertainment. I just want to do the will of the Lord. The burden is lifted up from my heart. I can go back to the Lord tonight and can say, Lord, I told them what you told me to tell them. You now can go back to the Lord and say, Lord, I think that man told us what you wanted him to tell us. And we are going to be sincere. We are going to repent. We are going to seek the face of the Lord. Or is there somebody there that says, no, I'm an angel. No problem with me. Isaiah saw the glory of God, the great prophet. And he said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live in the midst of unclean people. And the angel of the Lord came to him and touched his lips with the coal, taken from the altar of the Lord. He said, your sin is purged. Your iniquity is taken away. Immediately after that cleansing, God said, Who shall I send? And Isaiah said, Am I not available? Here am I. Send me. Let's rise up and pray. Let's surrender to the Lord. Just open your heart to the Lord. Just pray to the Lord. Amen. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word tonight. You have sincerely exposed your mind to us. You've sent your word from your altar and have made us to know what we ought to know. Lord, we come before the altar tonight with an open heart, with a willing mind. And we confess all our sins, all our inadequacies before your throne. And we we'll seek your mercy tonight that you forgive us, you will change us in the name of Jesus Christ. We know, Lord, that the blood is flowing to cleanse the blood is flowing to remove every state and every iniquity from our lives. Lord, I pray that tonight you will do so like you did in the life of Isaiah the prophet. You will do so tonight. You will change us. You will renew us. You will recreate us. You will remold us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, the word of declare. That whosoever is in Christ, be it a member or a minister, must be a new creature, and all things must pass away, and all things must become new. And Lord, tonight, any area of our life that is yet to be renewed, Father, we submit them to you, and we ask that you renew them in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh God in heaven, we thank you, because you have given to us the key tonight to successful ministry. To have an open Bible, a holy spirit, to learn and to repent and to change. And I pray that you will keep this key in our hearts, in our hands, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And Father, I'm asking, O oh God, that 
any area that we have erred before. I pray you will restore us back and accept us in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we are your servants and we are willing to obey your word. We are willing to turn and we are willing to repent. Accept us and use us in a greater dimension in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that you have brought us together so that you can make a turning point in our lives as well as in our ministry. And this is a sweet beginning. This is a wonderful beginning. And we believe, Lord, that this week shall be a week never to be forgotten in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, because you have answered our prayers tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen.